As you know, if you want to apply machine learning, you need data. And often the more the better. If you want to build a classifier, like a cat detector, you need to label which images have cats in them. If you want to find fraudulent credit card transactions, you need to label which transactions had fraud. But often, labels are hard to get because they're expensive and they require a human to review. But you might have a lot of unlabeled data. So maybe you have a lot of credit card transactions, but you don't know which ones are fraud and which are not. And it would be great if you could somehow leverage this data to learn something interesting that will help you solve other problems that you care about. This is exactly what autoencoders are. They're an unsupervised learning process that lets you take advantage of your unlabeled data and learn interesting things about the structure of that data that's often useful in other contexts. So for instance, you can build a better classifier by using autoencoders as a feature extractor. Or if you don't have any labels at all, you can use the autoencoders to flag anomalies that might get your labeling process started. You can even use them to fill in missing values. In this video, I want to talk all about autoencoders how they're structured, how they're learned, and how you can put them to use. I also want to talk about an interesting and kind of lesser known variant called denoising autoencoders. So let's dive in. In their simplest form, an autoencoder is a neural network that attempts to do two things. First, it compresses its input data into a lower dimension. Then, it tries to use this lower dimensional representation of the data to recreate the original input. The difference between the attempted recreation and the original input is called the reconstruction error. By training the network to minimize this reconstruction error on your data set, the network learns to exploit the natural structure in your data to find an efficient lower dimensional representation. Let's dig deeper into each part. The left part of the network is called the encoder. Its job is to transform the original input into a lower dimensional representation. That sounds pretty complicated, so let's take a couple minutes and discuss what it means to project something down into a lower dimensional representation and build some intuition for why this is a reasonable thing to do. The idea behind this is fairly simple. Imagine your two inputs are city and country. Maybe you have Tokyo, Japan, Paris, France, and so on. Even though it's conceptually possible to have Hong Kong, Spain, we don't actually see this in the real data. And this is because real data often lies on a lower dimensional subspace within the full dimensionality of the input. The point is, the real data isn't fully spread out across all possibilities, but actually makes up a small fraction of the possible space. For instance, Here's an example of points that are evenly spread throughout three-dimensional space. There's no structure here because the data is totally random, and there's no way to describe the location of all of these points using fewer than three numbers per point without losing information, because this data truly spans all three dimensions. In practice, our data has structure, which is another way of saying that it's constrained. Remember, Hong Kong Spain is conceptually possible, but we won't ever see it in the real data, so that part of the space is unoccupied. Here's an example of constrained data in the same space. We can still describe each point with three numbers, but this is somehow inefficient since the real data is constrained to a one-dimensional spiral. The trick would then be to find a new coordinate system where the constraints of the spiral are ingrained into it, and then we would only need a single number to describe any point without information loss. For this spiral example, we can represent it exactly. Here are the equations that translate the single angular dimension, theta, into the original three dimensions. For any particular point on the spiral, I can choose to describe it with a single number, theta, or I can describe it with three numbers, x, y, and z. It just depends on the coordinate system I'm using. So what does all this have to do with autoencoders? Well, the encoder approximates the function that maps the data from its full input space into a lower dimensional coordinate system that takes advantage of the structure in our data. So this section was pretty dense and mathy, so let me quickly summarize. Our real data is not random, but instead it has structure, and that structure means we don't need every part of our full input space to represent our data. And it's the encoder's job to map it from that full input space into a meaningful lower dimension. So now let's move on to the decoder.
The decoder attempts to recreate the original input using the output of the encoder. In other words, it tries to reverse the encoding process. This is interesting because it's trying to recreate a higher dimensional thing using a lower dimensional thing. This is a bit like trying to build a house by looking at a picture of one. We mentioned before that your true data can likely be described using fewer dimensions than the original input space, but the point of the middle layer in an autoencoder is to make it even smaller than that. This forces information loss, which is key to this whole process working. By making it so that the decoder has imperfect information and training the whole network to minimize the reconstruction error, we force the encoder and decoder to work together to find the most efficient way to condense the input data into a lower dimension. If we did not have information lost between the encoder and decoder, then the network could simply learn to multiply the input by one and get a perfect reconstruction. And this would obviously be a useless solution. We don't need a fancy neural network just to multiply something by one. The only way autoencoders work is by enforcing this information loss with the network bottleneck. But this means we need to tune the architecture of our network so that the inner dimension is less than the dimension needed to express our data. But how could you know that in advance? What we really want is a way of learning these representations using whatever architecture we want, without the fear that the network's going to learn this trivial solution of multiplying by one. And luckily, there's a clever tweak we can make that avoids that problem. And this gets us into the world of denoising autoencoders. The idea is this. Before you pass the input into the network, you add noise to it. So if it's an image, maybe you add blur. Then you ask the network to learn how to erase the noise that you just added and reconstruct the original input. So the reconstruction error is slightly modified so that the input to the encoder now has a noise term added. This means the network multiplying the input by one is no longer a good solution because this would just return the distorted image and still have a large reconstruction error. This is called a denoising autoencoder because it attempts to remove the noise that we added artificially to the raw data. Now that we have an understanding of how autoencoders are structured and learned, let's talk about some ways you can use them. The first is as a feature extractor. In this case, after we complete the training process, we chop off and throw away the decoder and just use the encoder part of the network. The encoder then transforms our raw data into this new coordinate system. And if you visualize the data in this new space, you'll find that similar records are clustered together. Here's a plot of embeddings of credit card transactions learned with a denoising autoencoder. If you look at the raw data of one of these clusters, you'll notice that they have almost identical features. This should make for an easier job for the classifier, as the autoencoder did a lot of the heavy lifting, and therefore your smaller data set will likely take you further. This can be useful even if you're not building a classifier. For instance, if you add a particular record of interest, you can find its nearest neighbors in this space, or run a clustering algorithm to find other records that are similar. This is likely to be more effective than clustering on the raw input features, since the network has learned about the structure in your data. This is particularly useful if your data is categorical in nature, as in this example, since it's not obvious how you search for nearest neighbors when your inputs aren't numeric. And if you don't have any labels at all, you can still use autoencoders for anomaly detection. In this case, you keep the full autoencoder and use the reconstruction error as the anomaly score. To grasp this, consider our previous example of a one-dimensional spiral in 3D space. What happens if we train our autoencoder on these spiral points, but then input an anomalous random point that's far from the spiral? Since our autoencoder would have only seen spiral points, the decoder would likely return a point that's close to the spiral, even though the input point was far from it. So for anomalous input points that are far from the spiral, we expect a large reconstruction error since the autoencoder just can't represent it well. This is why the reconstruction error can be a proxy for an anomaly score. The nature of an anomaly is that it doesn't respect the normal structure of the data, and this is where the autoencoder will have a hard time. Finally, you can use denoising autoencoders for missing value imputation. As an example, let's say you have these four rows of data where the first three are complete, but the last record has a missing value. The idea is that we train the network by randomly replacing true data with missing data and ask it to learn to erase the noise. 
Then, once the model is trained, we can pass in inputs that actually have missing fields and use the network to predict what the missing values are likely to be. We can then use these predictions to replace our actual missing values. I hope this video has given you an intuition for what autoencoders are, how they're learned, and what you might use them for. If you'd like more content like this, you can subscribe to my mailing list at blog.zachjost.com.